Let's assume we're going to look at charge, current, and resistivity. So you know what a simple circuit looks like. You have a battery and a bulb and some wires. This is what's needed to have a simple circuit working. This is how a battery would look. This is a circuit diagram. And this is how a bulb would look. And if you look at this, this here is a gain in potential energy. This is the battery giving energy to each charge. And as it moves through the wire and it goes to the bulb, it uses the energy. So it's a potential drop. The potential energies drop. This is what happens in a simple circuit. We use conventional current, which means it's the flow of positive charges from positive to negative. There is also negative charges, which is electronic current from minus to plus, the electrons that are moving. So this is just the flow of negative charges, which is what we have recently discovered. And this is the flow of positive charges, which we thought at first was the case, but now we know it's not. But we're keeping to conventional. It makes it easier using the right-hand rules and things later on. So we're going to stick with conventional current. So just make sure you know the difference between the two. Flow of electrons, like water coming from a tap. Conventional is the opposite. It's the flow of the positive charges. Very nice. If you wanted to calculate the charge, you can do that. You can just use Q equals IT, quit, that's the formula that I say. You can rearrange it to find I, which is Q over T. Makes a little triangle as well. Uh, you can have a little triangle if you need to. Q at the top, I and T. For grade 12, you need to see it written as this sometimes, DQ over DT. If you remember, D just means small. A small Q, small charge over a small amount of time. Sometimes it's written in integral form, which is Q equals I dt, which is the current in a small time frame. So it's the same formula, Q equals I t. It's just written slightly different. A simple example, battery switched on, 10 seconds, current is 2 amps. What is the charge? Well, we know the current is 2, we know the time is 10, we don't know Q, we know the formula, Q equals I t, put the numbers in, 2 times 10, 20 coulombs. Similarly, you can do the same thing if you want to find the current. We have Q, which is 50. We have T, which is 10. And we know that I is Q over T. Q over T. So you will do that. Put the numbers in. 50 over 10, 5 amps. And this is what electrons do when they're passing through a circuit. You have the batteries, you have the electrons going, and you can see that the current here, let's say 150, the same electrons are traveling we're still traveling, still traveling, same electrons, 150. They pass through the bulb, they use some energy, but I still have the same number of electrons. They did not disappear. These people are still here. They will go through, they will use up some more energy, maybe half and half, because the values are the same. And now over here, they have no energy left, but they are still the same. Still a number of people are here, still three, or I should say, still 150 milliamps flying through here, going back over to the battery, regaining their energy, and continuing again. We'll do this in more detail when we cover series and parallel circuits. Here are some circuit symbols that everyone should know. Uh, we need to know the ammeter. It looks like an A with a circle. Counts the electrons. Voltmeter, which is a V in a circle, measures energy. A cell, which is like one battery. We call that a cell, actually. It's a misconception. A battery means more than one, funnily enough. And that's where the energy comes from, okay? This is the EMF. This is the supply voltage. It's named many different things, okay? Battery of cell, if I have two batteries, I will have two of these. Three means I have three of these. And of course, oh, you should also know this is plus and this is minus. This is plus and this is minus. Make sure you remember that. That will be useful later as well when we're doing Kirchhoff's law. A lamp has an X in it. A resistor blocks the current and it looks like a rectangle or a squiggly line. A variable resistor, also a rectangle or a squiggly line, but with an arrow to show that you can change the value of how much the resistance is. A fuse is a safety device. I made a beautiful picture of it, but I've lost it now. I accidentally deleted it. This is a resistor with a, a wire in the middle, a straight wire in the middle, and what happens is electrons flow through it, and if the current is too much, it's designed to break. 
if I can have a maximum current of 2 amps, that means anything more than 2 amps, this fuse will break. We also, of course, have a switch, open and close these like a bridge. The ground looks like this. And three other ones that you may not really need to know about, but I'll show you. An inductor, a DC generator, which is basically like a battery. In time, instead, it's a circle. And an AC generator, like a waveform, because the current goes backwards and forwards in AC. Not too important, but the circuit symbols are there. Okay, so moving on. If you want to connect an ammeter, make sure you know that it is in series. It could be anywhere in the circuit, and the number will be the same. It needs to have a low resistance, because we want electrons to flow through it. We want the energy to flow. We want these things to go without any problems, because I want to measure how many electrons are flowing through the circuit, from positive to negative, conventional. Uh, voltmeter, similar idea. You want to measure the energy, but we need to know the difference of energy, so it must be in parallel. We don't want electrons to flow through here. We don't want this, so we must have a high resistance for this, so that electrons will not flow through here. So let's say that we're talking about the current flow now this way. Let's say we have electrons with 10 volts coming from the battery, 10 volts. So at the first point, the voltmeter will see 10 and then they will go through it. They will use some energy and they'll come out and it comes out. The voltmeter will say, oh, that says five. So I started with 10, I finished with five. This resistor used five volts. And then from here, we have this resistor and this resistor. This will use some energy, and this will use some energy. Same idea. But because I had 5 volts, each electron here only has 5 volts. So maybe this resistor says 5 over here, and it says maybe 1 over here. I don't know. Uh, that means that resistor has used between 5 and 1. That has used 4 volts. And then moving on, these electrons here passing through, passing through, and they only have one volt of energy. And you can kind of guess because the total is 10. If I've used 5 and I've used 4, that's 9. This should only be 1 anyway, which makes sense because I can use my 1 and I will have 0 at the end, and this is used 1 volt. Electrons are flowing, no energy left, voltage is 0. They will go, regain the energy, and continue in the circuit. This is how a simple circuit works. Okay, moving on, ammeter, low resistance, voltmeter, high resistance. That takes us to Ohm's law, which we did in the lab and in the simulation. Potential difference, potential energy difference. If the voltage is high, the current will also be high. Okay, um, Ohm's law, V equals IR. Increasing the current, increasing the voltage, and so forth. You should be able to take this formula and rearrange to find the current and the resistance. This is the fundamental formula. We will be using it a lot. An example, calculate the resistance of the motor. If you look at the triangle R, V divided by I, same idea. So R equals V divided by I. I know that this is my volts because it says 6V. And then this is my amps because it says 3 amps. 6 over 3 is 2 ohms. Easy. Okay, I'm going to skip them and move over to resistivity. We know resistance is blocking the current. Resistivity is how strong, how much it can block the current. Not the act of blocking, it is how strong it is. Stronger materials will have uh, more resistance, of course, because it has a higher resistivity. Cross-sectional area, you will see this word sometimes. This is how thick or thin a wire is. If I have a wire like this one, this is quite thick, big area here. You will have a small wire, and you can see that this area is very small. That's thin, okay? So resistance is higher if you have longer wires, thinner wires, and also, not part of the formula, but higher temperatures. It will also increase the resistance as well. And we did the formula for this. It looks something like this. R equals rho L over A. Rho, which is like a little p, is the strength, the resistivity of the wire. L is the length of the wire, and A is the area, the thickness of the wire. Area can sometimes be found by using pi R 
squared if it is a circle. Usually it's a circular wire. Here's an example. Find the resistance of a silver wire, 2 meters long. This is the cross-sectional area. Okay, so we have the area. Nice. So what we do is R equals rho L over A. Rho silver. Let's check silver. This will be given to you. You find the resistivity, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 8. For rho, I will put that here, 1.6. Multiplied by the length, 2 meters, right here. Area is 1 centimeter squared. We cannot use centimeters, so we have to convert centimeters to meters squared. So that means what I will do is take this times 10 to the minus 2, because you divide by 100, or times 10 to the minus 2. I will square it, it will be times 10 to the minus 4 instead. I will write that down and you will get your answer. Easy. This is for grade 12 only. This is for grade 12 advanced. You also may need to find the density of the current. You know how to find density of various things, the, your density of mass, density of charge. Now in term two, we have to know the density of the current. The density is the current divided by the area that is passing through. So current over area. This density that we know, We've already used rho for resistivity, so I cannot use it again. We will use J instead. So density will become J. J is I over A. The area is the cross-sectional area we were talking about in resistivity. The amount of electrons, in this case 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 electrons flowing through whatever my area is. Rearranging the formula nicely, it will be I equals J A. I J. Okay. Sometimes it's written like this in integral form, j multiplied by a small area. Here is an example. Find the current density when 40 amps is flowing through the battery given an area of 10 meters squared. Big area, just to keep it simple. Ija, we need to find the density, which is j, so we'll rearrange this. j equals i over a, 40 over 10, of course, 4 amps per meter squared. And there's another way to find resistivity. Uh, you can also use the electric field and the current density. If you know the electric field and perhaps the density as well, you can just use E over J. Okay, that will help you. If you don't know J, of course, you can do I over A from before, from the IJ formula. So this is another way to find the resistivity. Conductance, FYI, is the opposite of resistance, so it's 1 over ohms, okay, it's how much it, how well it is at conducting electricity, not blocking, conducting electricity, okay, the unit for that would be Siemens, done.